Hi, everyone. I want to welcome you today um, to today's program. This afternoon, we have the honor of having um, Ruth Zimbler here. Um, my name is Gia Pace. I'm Public Programs Coordinator at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. And um, Ruth is a survivor, and she um, is going to share with us her experiences today uh, about uh, Kristallnacht. So um, I'm going to hand over um, the floor to Ruth. If you have any questions, if you could please put them in the chat, and Ruth will be answering questions at the end of her at the end of her talk. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. Oh, good afternoon, actually. Um, I am Ruth Simler's word. I was born on February 22nd, 1928, in Vienna, Austria. The picture that you see on the screen right now is there because it's my third grade class. And it was the last time that I actually had a normal life because on March 12th, 1938, Hitler marched into Austria. And from then on, every day was another injustice and another indignity. Let me give you an example. My mother and I took me to the library every two weeks. And I used to take two books out and bring two books back. And, um, I went to the library a few days after the Angelus, after March 12th, with Mama, and I was returning two books, and I wanted to take two out, and the librarian wouldn't give me any. And I asked her why she wouldn't give me any, and she said, because you're a Jew. I said, you know, I was a Jew two weeks ago when you gave me the books. And she said, don't ask questions, just go home. So that was a blow to me because I liked the books. But then Mama and I were going home and there were two boys who were in my school, not in my class because we had girls' classes and boys' classes. And they walked behind Mama and me and they said loudly enough for us to hear, don't let the Jews get ahead of you. And they got ahead of us and they spit on the ground. Well, you know, that had never happened to me before, and I really couldn't understand it. At age 10, I guess you just understand so much and not many more. That was the first thing. The second thing was for, uh, happened to my mother. My mother used to um, shop like every housewife and, and when, you know, who did cooking and ran a home. Um, she um, used to go up shopping every morning because, you know, we had no refrigeration at that time. And um, we, um, and she used to, and the farmers who brought their goods in every day didn't have refrigeration either, no ice. So if you didn't shop early in the day, you got the dregs, you got the wilted vegetables and fruits and stuff like that. Well, m Jewish women could not uh, go shopping before four o'clock in the afternoon. So you can imagine what we got. But we did the best we could and that's what we had. The third thing was my father. My father used to go to the office at eight o'clock in the morning and come home at one o'clock for lunch and then have a couple of hours rest and then go back to the office was to work from about seven in the evening. So they had scrubbing parties. Now I have to explain those to you. Um, before the Lamont into Australia had an election campaign. And since there was no television and very little radio actually, what they did was they painted in the street, in the garage, they painted slogans and, and stuff, you know, that, that did you do during an election campaign. Uh, they, 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 these Nazis, these brown shirts who were really hooligans, um, used to go to the better neighborhoods where you had uh, uh, educated people and people who were somewhat money 
We used to go to the neighborhoods and they used to scrub. I give them a pail and soapy water and a scrub brush and made them get down on their hands and knees and scrub those um, slogans off. Well, it, it was an indignity, of course, but my father was such a positive man and had such a good sense of humor. He made nothing of it, but Mama was standing at the window waiting for him to come home for lunch was very, very um, upset, of course. She, she really was so frightened because they used to grab them in the street and sometimes take them to concentration camps. Dachau was the first one that was not necessarily built for Jews, but that's where they sent Jews. We, my father worked for the Jewish community in Vienna. We therefore lived in the biggest a synagogue complex in Vienna. I will just show that slide, please. It was um, the synagogue seated 2,240 people. And um, that's the one right there. And on either side of it, you see an apartment building. Well, we lived in the one on the left. And I could see the western wall of the synagogue from my room. We, we were on the ground floor. There were two, uh, four other families in the, in the building. They were all connected with the Jewish community. There were two cantors, the chief cantor of Vienna, who trained all the cantors, and his assistant, and two um, families whose um, husbands were deceased, but they had worked for the Jewish community in very high capacities. Um, is that, that's all right, I know that next slide was good. The synagogue was gorgeous, as you can see, that uh, was the Ellen Kubus, and it was magnificently built in 1852. So it had years behind it, and it was beautifully constructed. It was like a piece of art. So next one, please. And it was, uh, it was a, a, such a pity, such a pity when it was destroyed, as you can see. But let's see what comes in between. And finally, the next injustice to me personally was that they uh, expelled me from school. I could not go to, to the um, public school that I went to around the corner anymore. And they had designated a school that was three trolley rides away from us and took about an hour and a half each way. My parents said, no, that's not for us. And they enrolled me in a Jewish school, which was closer, just one trolley car right away. And I started to go to the school in May and finished out the term and then um, later on, of course, went back in September. We, uh, we live day to day, and as I say, one dignity after the other, some of which I don't even remember. But um, the ones that really hurt me, like the library, is something that I shall never forget. Well, we didn't go, I don't, don't, don't think we went on vacation that summer which we had done it the year before that. And we lived through the summer and everything went along just that way with injustices and with indignities. All. And then of course came November 10th. Now, the way November 10th came about was that a young man named Hershel Greenspan, who lived in Paris and was going to school in Paris, had parents in Germany, and he they suddenly deported them to Poland, which they did in many, many, many cases. So he went to the German embassy in Paris to find out how to get in touch with them. And there was absolutely no way that they would tell him. They told him to go work 
and disappeared. He went back the next day and he got the same guy and the, and, and the same answer. And the third day he came back with a gun and he shot him. And he shot him fatally, but he didn't die immediately. Now Hitler had been trying to think up some, some thing, that he could, big thing that he could do to the Jews. And um, he just needed an excuse and this was perfect. So as they were waiting for him to die, they plotted this, this uh, Kristana, as we called it, the night of the broken glass. And they were waiting, the, the brown shirts, this, this um, SA, which it was called, was um, waiting for a signal to start Nahum. And it came on the morning of no, uh, the month of uh, September, uh, November 9th and 10th. In our building, as I told you, the four other apartments, all the people came to our apartment to be together because they were so frightened. And um, it was uh, dawn, early, early morning when, these, uh, when the, the signal came. At that point, the caretaker of the synagogue, who was not Jewish, came into our apartment and said to Mama, take the children out of here. And she packed a bag and she took us out to the suburbs to an aunt of my father's, who was an elderly lady, um, not by today's standards, but then. And they were going to, Mama was going to leave us there and go back into the city, which she did. And when she got back into the city, my father and our housekeeper, Marie, was not in the apartment. And the apartment had a, a German seal across the um, entrance. And it said, keep out and don't come in. So I'm sorry. I'm trying to leave that. Oh, oh I'm. Oh dear. I'm sorry. Don't listen to that. Anyway, so we, so anyway, um, they um, they they were not in the apartment, and the apartment was locked up. Said, do not enter, had um, swastika on it in German seal. And so we could not, uh, we could not get in. My mother couldn't get in. She didn't know where my father was. What had happened was when she was on her way back, um, the um, Nazis came and took my father and Marie to the police station and they interrogated them. And they let Marie go, of course, and they took my father to Dachau. And we came, we, we were, st were uh, still at the apartment out in the suburbs when a big fat Nazi came in and he said, get out, you Jewish cow, a Jewish pig. You go and get out of this apartment because it's now mine. She started to cry. She said, I can't go. I have to take that guy out with children. I don't give a damn about the kids. Get, go, 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 go. It's my apartment. So she packed us up and she took us back. By the time she took us back, it was like 4.30 in the afternoon or 5 o'clock. And it was dark. It was November like now. And she uh, tried to go into the apartment and couldn't. So we came out into the street, and in the street, there was a lineup of all of the um, fire equipment that you could possibly think of, and the firefighters, one after the other, all along the block. The synagogue complex took off most of the block, so they were all in front of it. And there was a, a nice fireman standing there, and Tante went over to him and he said, uh, can't get into the apartment, what shall I do with the children? He said, well, I think their parents are probably deported. 
uh, and you'll have to find a way to take care of them. And she said, and the synagogue is burning, the whole inside is burning, 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 and the flames are going up. And my brother, who was four years younger than I, he was six, um, was scared to death when we saw this. And you know, I asked the students that I usually speak to, to imagine this, but you know, you don't have to imagine it because about a year ago or so, remember all the pictures we saw of the Notre Dame Cathedral in, in flames and how frightening that was, but that's the way this was. The flame spurted out of the, uh, out of the top of the buildings and it was, the, the uh, stained glass windows were broken and they were crunching under my feet, which I feel every day for the rest of my life. It's just horror, horror of that crunch, crunch, crunch. Well, we were walking along the street slowly because we just didn't know what to do when some neighbors and, and friends from across the street waved us up to the apartment and we went up and they were so kind, they fed us, put us to bed. And Tante wanted to go back to, to um, her home to see if she could get some things out or be there. And so she, um, when she, um, um, she, she, they wouldn't let her go that night. So she went the next morning and as it was, it was a miracle really, because uh, that uh, Nazi had no legal right to her to her place and they let her live the, out her life there through the war and everything. So now we are upstairs with the wieners and we're looking out the window the next morning and mama is wandering around in the same clothes she wore the same the day before and we don't know what's going on. Called her up. She came upstairs. She was surprised to see us because she really thought we were safe out there. And um, she said, I don't know where your father is. I don't know, I can't find him. And remember, no telephone. The telephone was in the house, no cell phone. The telephone was in the house, the house was locked up. So it took a couple of days before she found him. What happened was they sent him to the house I mentioned. And um, he, um, uh, he, and he had a talent and, um, at that time, they were, they were still trying to get rid of the Jews. They wanted to, to get out. So anybody who could get papers to any place to go had to fill out a myriad of, um, of documents. And my father was an excellent interpreter of documents and used to help people to, to get through all that red tape. So they needed him. So the Nazis came and got him out and they um, set him up in his office. He had a, a couch in his office, so he'd let him sleep a few hours every day. The rest of the time they brought him food and they made him stay there and they had no way of getting in touch with anyone, but she found him. He was only in, in Dachau for 36 hours, which was plenty. Anyway, so, um, it took a lot of um, protection, as they call it, um, influence from a lot of people to get us back into our apartment. It took 10 days. So I'm gonna give you dates. Here's November 10th. We're back in the apartment November 20th. And the apartment is cleaned up. They had broken the door. Uh, they had, it had four panels and they broke it, one panel out from the bottom and apparently a skinny person got in there and they took everything that was not nailed down. And by that, I mean everything, stripped everything like bedding and clothing and certainly all the jewelry and, uh, and um, all of the Judaica, all of those things, everything was gone. So we had to start and um, we had to start from the beginning because November you go to sleep without a blanket, it's cold in there. So with friends' help and with uh, buying a few things and so on, we got back in the apartment 
And it's now December 20th. I go back to school and I come home. My mother is sick in bed. She has um, strep throat. And she um, uh, has friends there. And the friends have boxes of chocolate and, us, and they leave. And I say to my mama, mama, why, what's this business? Uh, nobody's birthday last week or this week or next week. And she said, it's okay. They just brought me the candy because I'm sick and they wanted to see me. And that was, it didn't, it didn't sound right. It didn't sound right to me. And I said, mama, tell me the truth. What is really going on? And she said, um, tomorrow you go to Holland. I said, no, go to Holland. What are you talking about? I'm not going anywhere without you and Papa. But my mother was one of those who you just couldn't say no to because she didn't accept it. And she wanted to, um, uh, and what, what Mama said, you did, you know, it was one of those people. And she had strength, such a strength of character, which came in handy afterwards. But then it was so she, we got suitcases out here, walked a little one and me a, a little one. And we took some clothing and necessities, the things that we needed, and um, packed. The next day was Saturday, and um, the next day was Yes, it was Saturday. So after the Sabbath, we needed to go to the um, to the railroad station to get on a train. Mama was sick, so my aunt Lucia, my fa my um, father's brother's wife, took us. And as we walked through the um, the courtyard, which would have been my playground. Um, we, um, she said to me, the walls for the synagogue were still standing. The whole inside was burnt out, but the, but the walls were still standing. She said to me, you better kiss that wall because you'll never see it again. Well, up to now, I've been keeping my cool. But when she said that, I fell apart. That was the end, and I started to cry and sob and yell and my brother who was a little kid and very cute he said um Lucy, you better stop crying because if you don't i'm gonna cry too and then there'll be real trouble so i had to stop crying got to the railroad station papa was already there because he threw his job was checking off the kids. And you can imagine what the feeling was on this railroad station because the parents all had to say goodbye to their kids. And he didn't know when they were, whether they would ever see them again. And many, many, many of them did not. We were 400 kids. We were the first kinder transport out of Vienna on December 12, 19. 38. Of the 400 kids, by the way, it was called the Kinder Transport. Of the 400 kids, 300 approximately went to England and we went to Holland. To Holland went to Holland. How did Kinder Transport come about? In England, there was this wonderful, wonderful woman who was a Quaker. And she had a friend in the House of Lords. And she went to him and she said, look, we've got to do something for these kids because the parents, we can't do anything for, but we can take the ch children for at least the length of this craziness. At that time, they didn't think it was going to end the way it did. They thought it was going to be a, a short, uh, stint there with, with those Nazis. So um, they, they, um, he, he went to the House of Lords and he got a, a law passed that they would take 10,000 children over a period uh, to England and they would take care of them and they would pay a 
a small sum uh, for each child. And so the law, as the law passed, they started these transports. Our whole train was devoted to children. And we came from a big, um, um, can't, uh, big, big um, cities and small cities and teeny, teeny weeny villages from um, Austria, Germany, and Czechoslovakia. And as I said, ours was the first, and it was the largest actually that went for, at one time. Those, the um, uh, train started after the Sabbath, and uh, we started to pick up kids on the way as well. Uh, so uh, that we crossed many borders, and every border we crossed, the Germans, the Nazis came on and harassed us. So we couldn't even get a good night's sleep on the train. But finally, we got to Holland in the morning. And uh, the lovely Dutch ladies were there with hot chocolate and donuts and sweets and um, doled them out to all of us. Now, we who were staying in Holland were separated from the, the almost 300 kids who were going to England. And they, uh, it was the Hook of Holland, as it was called. And they got on a ferry that went to Harwich in England. Now, next slide, please. Yes. Uh, and um, that is the building that we went to. It was a converted school. It was in The Hague. And it had been set up to be a dormitory and um, fill all our needs. We were sent to this school uh, for six weeks for quarantine. They didn't know our medical histories and they wanted us to be well and they didn't want us to bring any uh, illnesses to the country. So they gave us all the shots that kids had from the beginning, from, the beginning, from when they were babies until uh, the, the most recent shots and um, and they installed us into beds and uh, they um, had a kitchen there, they fed us there and they, um, they tried to have us keep up with our schoolwork. So they sent teachers in and people to take care of us. They were really very, very concerned and very, very good. After the six weeks, oh, and they tried to show us, uh, you know, uh, Dutch life and Dutch culture, so we would get acculturated for a little bit. And um, we, after the six weeks, we moved to, um, we were separated into three groups, um, girls group, a boys group, and a mixed group. And of course, I had the brother, so I was with the mixed group. And uh, they um, put us into a wonderful, wonderful building. Next slide, please. And there it is. In, uh, in a gorgeous park on the outskirts of the Hague. You see the three windows up on the second floor. The only thing that's different from the way it is now to the way it is, it was then was there was a big yellow slide that came out of those three windows. It was a fire slide, but um, we used it as a, uh, as a, as a toy, or not a, a big toy, but as um, an entertainment. We used to take a piece of carpet, we used to sit three across, we used to slide out and run out the, run around the back and come sliding again. Because most of us, we didn't have a toy that we brought from home because you know that, that was not on our parents mind so but it was a beautiful setting and it had been, had belonged to a wealthy family that went um, uh, uh, to Asia and gave it to the government to use and they used it for various things and um, we were about um, under a hundred kids there 
I had thought we were more, but when I saw it again in 1955, when my uh, father, my husband took us uh, on a trip, it was the first time back, and um, I saw that I couldn't possibly accommodate a hundred, but maybe sixty or eighty. But um, we were from all over the place. Um, as a matter of fact, next slide will show you. You see, sick. I, uh, as you know, came from Vienna, which um, Austria was a landlocked country. So we had lots of lakes, but we had no seashore. And you can see me on the right of the um, nurse and my brother, the littlest one in front of the nurse. And the other kids were from various places. The one next to my brother, the two of boy and girl, were um, twins and uh, they, they were the only ones who left before us. They went to Australia. Their parents were able to go and they went to Australia. Um, the older girls um, were like, uh, and boys were 15, 16. And um, they came from Berlin and from other places in Austria. So for the first time, we saw um, this ocean and it was forever water. And it was so interesting to us. It was so exciting that um, we really were impressed with, with the immensity of this water. And this was near the beach at Skaveningen. And um, it was um, a, a, a beautiful, beautiful sight. So after that, we, we when we lived in, in Schreveningen, we had, um, uh, actually it was called Park of And uh, it, um, we, we had um, chores to do with our beds and we cooked and we, were, uh, we learned how to plant things. And it was really very, and, and the teachers came, they kept coming all the time. And um, we really, really had um, a safe environment and uh, they were very, very good to us and took us to many places. One of the places that I shall never forget and that you should do if you can have possibly do it, go to Holland in April because that's when the tulips come out and oh, what a sight to see. They took us to the tulip fields and between the tulip fields, there were little canals and we used to get into a rowboat and we used to go uh, rowing through the fields. Now the fields were what was so fantastically stunning. Each field was one color. There was not one tulip in the whole field that um, was a different color from the whole field. And it was so beautiful, so, so beautiful. And you can't forget that. That's something that sticks in your head forever. Well, we were there from um, January until uh, the end of August. The end of August, suddenly they moved us into the city, also in a beautiful mansion. And we started to go to school. And um, it, it came about that, that my father was able to get the um, a visa to the United States. It took him a year and a half. He applied the day after Hitler marched in. And so we were supposed to go back to Vienna to be examined physically by the American consul. And um, it got to be September 1st, and of course, that was the end of it because we had um, ship's bullets for the 5th of September and that was for field. So we were, we were in this uh, beautiful building um, in the Hay and uh, I started to go to school because the kids all left in my accent. But I came home again on a Friday afternoon 
on October 15th. And um, they were whispering about us. And I said, what's happening? What's going on? And they finally told me that the next day, October 16th, I was going to, um, I, we were, the two of us were going to the United States. And again, I said, what are you talking about? I'm not going further away from my parents. This is ridiculous. I'm not going, but of course, uh, like um, my mother had made the arrangements and I told you, nobody's asked no to my mother, even though if, at first when she called to tell them to put us on this ship, it's called the old brother. Um, they said, you're crazy. We're not going to send them anywhere. But it, it, nobody says no to my mother. She called them every hour on the hour for a long hour. And they finally said, we got to get rid of this crazy lady. And so she, and so they said yes. On the Saturday morning, they sent a uh, private car with a, a representative from the, from the um, Dutch government to pick us up. And he picked us up and he took us to Amsterdam, first to the German consulate or embassy. And um, got us a passport. Would you put that on for me, please? Uh, there's the passport. Got us a passport. And as you can see, the red J for Jew. And the signature Ruth Sarah Munchine. I mean, my name is not Sarah. So, um, uh, but all Jews have to sign their name, Sarah, and all men, Israel. Happens to be my brother's Hebrew name, so that was okay there. Anyway, so he took us there first, and then he took us to the American um, embassy, and they gave us a green card, and they gave us, um, a, 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 you know, um, permission to come into the United States. The ship sailed at midnight on Saturday night, October 16th, and we, um, I woke up in, uh, the following morning, Sunday morning, and I was seasick, and I was seasick the whole way through. And um, I, we got into the English Channel, and there was a huge, huge storm. And it was, um, the sea was yellow, and the sky was yellow, and I thought it was my last hour. So I went into the library, and I wrote a letter to my parents, and I said, I'm gonna die. And this is the end. Um, it's been nice knowing you, but that's the way it is. And of course, I was gonna send that letter, but it didn't happen. So, uh, as I said, I was seasick all the way over, but you know what happened before was someone, I don't know whether it was from an organization or how it happened, but everyone who, who, who boarded the ship uh, in our situation got $2.40. And um, since I was so sick and couldn't eat anything, I, I wanted to, to um, I wanted uh, to, to, to drink mineral water, which wasn't part of the deal with the ship. So I had to pay for it. But the first thing I did was to send a telegram to my parents that we were aboard ship. I thought that was pretty good for a time. I was only 11 if I went for another meal. Anyway, so, and the $2.40 that, that um, Walter got, my brother, I pulled aside, he didn't touch. So, um, we we uh, had damage to the ship during that storm that I mentioned. We lost part of the propeller, and so it took us three or four extra days to get to the United States. It took us ten days. We arrived in New York, in Hoboken um, on um, the twenty sixth of October, and we were picked up at the at the um, ship by an aunt of my mother's whom she didn't know, none of us knew. And she um and she picked this aunt 
picked us up and took us home. She had a brownstone in the um, bedside at that time, but she also had a pea green Pontiac in which she picked us up. And oh, I never saw a pea green car before because I saw the grub. Maybe, maybe did. And uh, I sat there in the car like a princess, you know, I was big shot. And she took us home. And you know, my parents and I corresponded all the time that we were in Holland. Uh, and Papa always said, everybody always said, I'll see you in six weeks. I'll see you in six weeks. Because I used to be able to put my head on that. You know, we used to go to the country for six weeks every summer. And um, without him, and, he, he, and, and we saw him again in six weeks. So I figured that's all right. So, uh, well, it didn't happen that way. But when we got here to the United States, it only took three weeks and they came. They were on, on one of the um, Italian ships and they came to New York um, up in the 60s, I guess, to the piers. And my aunt took me there. Uh, again, they came on a Friday. And um, they, my, my father was literally, literally famous because they had two huge crates built because they brought everything that they owned that could be portable because they didn't know where the next island was coming from. So they had two of those and the um, stevedores in Genoa, uh, where they left from, um, took advantage and made them um, give bribes. And so he gave him the last, the last cent. And when I was able to give him the 2,040 cents that I'd saved from Walter, he felt like a millionaire because suddenly he had some money in his pocket. And don't forget 1939, you could buy three rolls for a nickel. So it was money. So it took a few weeks before they got an apartment and in early January they had an apartment, had a few sticks of furniture, goods, place Sydney. Uh, and we moved in with them and started to go to school. And since then, you know, the, a real good life. My father was a great American patriot. He loved this country. We all did. And we were so busy becoming Americans as quickly as we possibly could. It was wonderful. And there were ups and downs like everybody has. And both my brother and I were beautifully educated and beautifully married and happily married. And we've got, each one of us has two children. And I have six grandchildren. My old brother only has three. But what a wonderful life it has been. And there's a message that I give to everyone that I speak with, and that is, is love one another, support one another. If you see an injustice, do something. Don't be a bystander, be an upstander. And if you see an injustice, grab somebody in the family who thinks like you or at school or a friend or whatever and go and do something. You see something, do something. And you know, some years ago when they heard the massacre in Darfur, they um, uh, wrote a song, one of them was Michael Jackson, I believe, and they performed it for charity for a Darfur charity. And the song goes, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. So let there be peace on earth and begin with you. You are the future. You can make the future a better place than you found it. Thank you all. Thank you, Ruth. Um, we have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, so I'd like to start with um, uh, Chris Peterson, 
and she is saying that her class is wondering if you're still able to speak in your original language. Do you have any friends from your childhood you're still in contact with? And what were your thoughts and how were you able to survive your time in hiding? I wasn't in hiding ever. I was out there in front of all the people, but it was at home and it was without my parents. But do, can I do my, I can do my native uh, uh, language, but you know, I was 10 years old. So it's a 10 year old uh, vocabulary and it's, it's not what it should be at uh, age 92. So that is one. What was the other part of the question I forgot? Um, are you still in contact with any friends from your childhood? Oh, so I have to tell you a little story if you, if you don't mind. Two years ago was the 80th commemoration of Kristalna. And um, someone wrote an article about me and about what I just told you um, in the New York Post. The, the, the next day, uh, there was a phone call to the museum to find out if she could get in touch with me because it sounded very, very much like her life. And they asked me and I said, sure, because I knew who it was. And she called me immediately. I just I hadn't even hung up the telephone. And after 80 years, we were reunited uh, she's in that picture in, in the school and um, the first one that you saw. And we love each other because we think alike and we are so very much alike. She's fantastic. And I'm so lucky to find, she found me actually. And now we, we're in touch every week for sure. And we did see each other for the year before the lockdown. So, and we would love to see each other now, but it's not so easy. Anyway, she's a precious, precious woman. And I'm, I'm really excited about that. Other than that, I, I had a best friend, Sylvia, um, but she, um, uh, but we, we, we grew apart here in the United States. We, we, we were different from another, very different. Uh, so I think that answers your question. Thank you. Um, what did your father do professionally in Vienna that provided him with access to the visas? Oh, my father was educated as a mechanical engineer. But when the depression came and it came there as well as it came here, uh, they sure didn't need anybody to help them build locomotives. So he, he lost his job and he started to work at the um, Jewish community in Vienna, which was a huge one. And uh, it was, um, the way it was run was that every Jew was registered there from birth to, to uh, death. And he was in the, um, um, uh, what you call it, in, in the department that helped people. And, um, and as I told you, he knew how to interpret documents. Came to the United States and of course didn't have the language, but uh, with the help of, of um, family um, that we had not known, he was able to get a job making iron doors. He was making $23 a week and our rent was $23 a month. So you can imagine. Uh, he worked there for, it was a night shift job. He worked there for a while and then got a job with the Circle Wire and Cable Company which is out in Queens, I think Massbooth. And um, he worked there the rest of his life. He, repaired all the machinery. And at that time, you know, it was almost wartime. It was wartime actually, but, um, and, and you couldn't get parts for machines. And if he didn't, if he, it wasn't available, he made them and he worked there for the rest of his life. 
and he was able to give us a good life. And Mama, Mama was a superb seamstress and what you would almost call a dress designer and she made dresses. She, the first dresses she made when she first came were four dollars a dress and if it had a jacket it was four fifty. It took her a week to learn. But and she worked probably for, to the end of her life. And um was able to give us an education, although we went to a Brooklyn College, both of us, which gave us a superb education and only cost us books and registration, which I earned with afternoon jobs uh, after I was 14 or 15 years old. So that's what Papa did. Thank you. So somebody wants to know if you experienced um, anti-Semitism while you were in Holland. Well, I did not experience it there because until the Hitler came in, I didn't feel it. And I'm sure it was there. I'm sure that if you talk to my parents and ask them, they would tell you, yeah, it was there. But I didn't feel it. The kids who used to come to play with me now in our court job were both uh, a Christian and Jewish, and um, uh, that I didn't feel it. Here in the United States, I really haven't felt it either, but I know it's there. I know it's there, I know it's in the colleges, I know it's in the streets. Uh, so I really, really didn't um, experience it as such, not, not as such. Did you ever return to Austria? Yes, I did. I, um, the first time my husband took us, um, we went to Europe, as I mentioned to you before. Um, he took me to, um, no, we didn't go to Vienna, no, to looking to. Um, he took me to um, Holland. 1955, my brother was stationed in Germany. Um, and he, um, and I had to, been working for five years, saving my pennies. And I went to Europe for six weeks and among them were several days in Vienna. And it happened to be uh, in September of 1955, um, the Russians were moving out. Remember they have a, uh, districts um, in, in, in Vienna and in Berlin that were, um, 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 each, uh, each of the major uh, powers had a, had a piece. And our uh, neighborhood was Russian. And um, they moved out first and second of September, and I happened to be here at that time. And the second time I was there for any length of time was with my daughter and my daughter in law. Oh, my daughter wants to see where I came from. And I was there, um, I think in 86, 96, I can't remember. Anyway, it was, was 20 some odd years ago. And um, the, they were, the, the, the synagogue had been uh, flattened and it was a parking lot for a while. And then when we were there, they were building a multi-use tall building that still belonged to the Jewish community. But my building is standing and it's, it's, it's a working building. Uh, there are several apartments now and there is a school in our apartment which is run by a good Israel, which is a very religious school. And that's kind of a, a revenge, as my daughter called it, that we saw this school growing in our apartment. Uh, somebody asked what the name of the synagogue was that we showed earlier. Exactly. What was that? The, the name of the synagogue. Leopoldstadt's was... synagogue. Leopoldstadt was the area, was a very Jewish um, um, neighborhood. 
and uh, the, the synagogue was called the Leopoldstädter Temple. What was it like to move around so much as a child? Well, it wasn't that much really. I mean, it was to Holland and to America. And then in the United States, you know, it was several places, but not that many. And um, you, know, you just go with the flow. What can you do? You can't put, you can't, um, you can't fight it. It's that, that's, that's it. You either go uh, or you're, you're miserable, but then we, we refuse to be miserable. And we just went wherever we needed to be. Ruth, is there anything else you want to add in closing? Um, how, how much time do we have? We yeah. have about, about four, four or five minutes. Okay, let me tell you one story that I think you will find interesting and that nobody else will tell you. A f above our apartment in Vienna was the Jewish Theological Seminary for the state of Austria. And we trained the rabbis for the whole of Spain. And we had a library that was outstanding. There had been Jews in Vienna for 400 years and those, the library reflected that and had fantastic thinkers, seminal thinkers, uh, write books, um, sermons, uh, philosophy, you name the most uh, highly valued teachings that were in that library. So where a few days after Hitler marched into Austria, I was home in the afternoon after school with my friend Sylvia, who by the way was an American because her father was an American and they were going to America in a few weeks. And my brother, Walter, and our housekeeper, Marie. And um, the knock came on the door and this man in seven in clothes, but with that long black leather coat that the Nazis wore, the top ones anyway. And he asked for the keys to the library. And, my, um, and Marie asked for the identification and he gave it to her. And so she gave him the keys and he went upstairs and he was up there for, it was directly above us. He was up there for a couple of hours and then he came down and he asked to see the children. So we came into the room where we were playing and um, I don't know, uh, Sylvia smelled something. She didn't like him. She just didn't like him and she started to howl. Um, he was patting my brother on the, on the head. My brother was blonde and blue and, and he was um, asking him questions and he asked me. And um, Marie said to him, you better get out of here because these kids, uh, you are frightening the children. So he gave her back the keys and he said to her, I took what I wanted and I'm taking it out. And tomorrow the trucks are coming for the rest. And you know what happened to the rest, they burned them. But um, he took these books and they were meant for a museum that was going to be built after there were no Jews in the world to show that there had been such people and that there had been such a culture. He left. I didn't know anything about it. When they caught this man in Argentina and brought him to Israel, the newspapers started to carry the story. And there was a picture of several high-level Nazis. And he was in it. And I said, oh my God, that's the guy. So. That's when Eichmann was in my apartment. And that's what it was like. And I don't think you will hear that from anyone else because it happened to me. I think that's it. Thank you. Well,
so much, Ruth. Um, we have so much gratitude for you sharing your story today. And um, the it chat- was a great, It was a great privilege to be able to share this with you. And I want you to tell everyone that you heard, please. Yeah. And um, we have so many people in the chat saying thank you to you and um, uh, have a, a wonderful day, everyone. And uh, we're gonna yes. end our program here. And uh, be, be safe, everybody. Be safe, everyone. Take care now. <laughs>